a treatment change is no small move. Of course, the hope is always that the change will lead to better outcomes, and ideally, any change in treatment or dosing is the well-informed result of a quality shared decision-making process engaged in by the patient, their loved ones, and their medical professionals. But what happens when we make a change and don't necessarily experience the benefits we had hoped for? What if the change was particularly difficult to coordinate or set up? How does that impact the way we may feel about addressing subpar outcomes? And what if we've been rather public about this change, sharing our story on panels, webinars, through social media? Does that create additional challenges to processing and accounting for what is really going on? Now, I do want to acknowledge that being in a position to even consider a change in treatment is in and of itself something of a privilege, considering that there are access issues faced by people with hemophilia all around the world, and considering that the overwhelming majority of people with rare diseases have no treatment options at all. Still, for the person who has decided, I'm not fine. I'm going to make a change. Only to later find themselves once again saying, uh-oh, I'm still not fine. Or, well, I was fine there for a little while, but now I'm not again. Well, this is an under-discussed topic and something that I'm proud to welcome my blood brother from across the pond, Luke Pembroke, to join me in discussing today here on I'm Fine. Luke, my man, thanks for joining us. Pleasure to have you back on Bloodstream. The pleasure is all mine, Patrick. Thanks for having me. Of course. I want to dive right in if you don't mind. So you made a decision to change to gene therapy. Now, as some listeners already know, you started gene therapy for hemophilia in the context of a clinical trial, which is admittedly a different starting point for a treatment change than if it were a commercially approved product. Is that, Do you believe in general that's a fair statement, Luke? Yeah, in general, I think it's fair to say that. Great. Now, I kind of want to move past the clinical trial particulars of your story and focus on your experience with the therapy from the time you started on it through now with a focus on this idea of entrenched resiliency and the drivers of this I'm fine mindset. So, Luke, my first question is, what were your expectations of gene therapy as a treatment? And once you were comfortably onboarded to the new therapy, the rhythm, the lifestyle, once it felt like you were in it, when did you begin to question whether or not you were doing fine with gene therapy? And, and how are you gauging that sort of, I don't know, call it quality of life measurement? Yeah, it's a good question. So moving past that incredibly challenging and intense first year post-dosing, my main hopes were that I'd be free from regular prophylaxis and ideally not having any bleeds. But to be honest, I didn't have any clear cut ideas on where I'd like to be following gene therapy. I'd only known a life with severe haemophilia before, right? So sure. that adjustment to being functionally cured took some time. But I mean, a lot of that was a case of nice problems to have, right? Suddenly worrying that I hadn't done my pro fee before heading out and then realizing, oh yeah, I, I don't need to do that anymore. Right. Things were great and I was definitely riding the high. I mean, I got in better shape. I spent two months living in the Amazon rainforest, hiked the Inca Trail. Then I made my way to Montreal for WFH, caught up with you. That's right. And then I spent those following weeks hiking in Canada's national parks. And during that whole time, my hemophilia didn't cause me any issues. Like, to be honest, it almost became an afterthought. So fast forward to autumn of that year, back in rainy England, I started to notice serious pain in my left ankle. And I mean, it was a level above the norm I'd got used to, right, Patrick? Uh. So I knew I wasn't bleeding, but I knew something wasn't right. And at first I figured it would pass and it was just a bad arthritic flare up, been there, done that but it didn't. And part of me hadn't really considered that my ankle could get worse after gene therapy, but that's exactly what was happening. Mm. So eventually <laughs> I decided it was time to speak to my hemophilia physio team. 
and a lot has happened since then. But the long and short of it is I'm in more pain on a daily basis now than I ever had been before. And I mean, I sure didn't have that on my post-gene therapy bingo card, to be honest. <laughs> no kidding, but so important to just be honest about that. So, And you've been so incredibly brave and vulnerable, and I'm, I'm not just saying that. You've been sharing your journey with gene therapy and clinical trials, and the global bleeding disorders community has eaten it up, myself included. <laughs> that being said... I'm curious, how do you think your being so public about your decision and your experiences has impacted your true sense of satisfaction with the therapy and your idea of your own lived experience? In other words, have you felt this pressure to, I don't know, be positive about gene therapy or, or to hide some of the harder parts? Have you been holding back? Like, tell, tell me how you're openly sharing your story plays a role in assessing your own health and treatment satisfaction. So I actually recall a discussion I had with my therapist about this very thing. It was about a year following having received gene therapy. And I spoke about how I felt this immense pressure to be actively advocating and sharing my experiences in relation to the gene therapy. Mm -hmm. And I felt like people really wanted to hear the headline grab grabbing success story, right? I did mm -hmm. a lot of interviews with like mainstream media too, and that's all they wanted to hear. Mm. But also within the haemophilia community itself, there was an element of that. But of course, the whole gene therapy experience was so much more nuanced than that for me, and I'm sure it is for many who've been through it. Mm. I was also acutely aware of how fortunate I was to have had the opportunity to even receive gene therapy. And so I think... On a subconscious level, I was quite hesitant to be out there moaning about the not so good side of things. Mm -hmm. And I also think some people, both those I know in and outside of the community, so we're talking my normal mates, as I call them, uh, <laughs> the, the unaffected, uh, mm -hmm. there's this perception that gene therapy is the ultimate solution. Right. So when I started having these more serious ankle issues, it was perhaps a bit hard for people to comprehend. Mm. There was this, I don't know, possibly you've had gene therapy, so you should be fine view on things. Mm. But of course, that hasn't been the case. And I've had many opportunities to share my experiences, but they've often felt shoehorned into an agenda where people either want a positive story or a not so positive one. But of course, as I said, it's just not that black and white. So I don't feel like I've ever shied away from sharing the bad parts or the hard parts. And I mean, I've certainly been vocal about the good bits too. So I don't feel like I ever shied away from sharing the hard parts. Mm -hmm. And I've certainly been vocal about the good bits too. But over time, I felt the pressure to share so openly took me out of my own head. And I really needed to step back and focus on how I was actually doing. So I guess, Luke, as a final question then, given everything that you've learned from this experience with gene therapy thus far, how do you intend to best self-advocate for the kind of healthcare support that you need to ensure that you are actually optimally managing hemophilia in your life? So... I think it really boils down to not ignoring what I'm feeling, which sounds simple, but of course it, it never really is. No. And acknowledging that, yes, of course, I'm lucky to have received gene therapy, but it was never going to solve all of my haemophilia-related problems. I knew that going into it, right? Mm. Now, I know my haemophilia team are still there for me. They've enforced that with me continuously. So I just need to make sure I'm confident enough to reach out to them and tell them when things aren't actually fine. And in fairness, they have been incredible. I couldn't ask for a better treatment team, but they can't treat my stubbornness. <laughs> that one yeah. is definitely on me. Yeah. Well, you and me both, and I think a lot of other blood brothers and sisters <laughs> share that trait as well. Well, <laughs> Luke, thank you. Again, your honesty continues to inspire and frankly, I think set a standard for how we as patient advocates ought to 
share about our own experiences. Listeners, if you're not already, you can follow Luke on social media. And lucky listeners, I'm happy to announce here at the end of the segment today that Luke will be joining the producing team of the I'm Fine segment here on the Bloodstream Podcast in 2024. So you will be hearing his written scripts and spoken words throughout the year. And Luke, we are stoked to have your invaluable perspective join the team. So welcome, my man. Thanks very much, Patrick. It's honestly a pleasure and a privilege to work on a segment like this. And I think it's so important that we question and challenge ourselves to make sure we're doing all we can to live as best as we can. So thank you very much to you and the Believe team for including me. And I'm really looking forward to getting stuck in and shaping this segment moving forwards. No one, hemophilia or not, wants to make a change in their lives only to find out that the results they hoped for weren't realized. It can be discouraging and demoralizing. And you know what? That's okay, at least for a moment. It stinks to be disappointed or frustrated by a less than ideal outcome, but don't give up on yourself. And don't stop yourself from truly assessing what's going on because of some type of external pressures. You deserve better. Don't stop trying to find a path forward that's right for you and work with loved ones and professionals in your life who can help you find it. Thanks to Luke Pembroke for joining me on today's segment, and thanks, as always, to Sanofi for supporting the I'm Fine segment here on Bloodstream. Please share this segment or episodes with friends, family, or colleagues who you think may benefit from the content, and we'll catch you next month with the latest installment of I'm Fine. Hemophilia severity is determined by factor activity levels, a measurement of how much factor you have in your blood at time of diagnosis. The more factor you have in your body over time, the better your bleed protection is, which is why many people with hemophilia choose to treat prophylactically. Your doctor can perform measurements to evaluate the factor activity levels in your blood. Learn more about the importance of factor activity levels by talking to your doctor and visiting levelsmatter.com. Sanofi aims to raise the bar for patients living with hemophilia. Reimagine what's possible by visiting rarebloodddisorders.com to hear more about Sanofi's dedication to the bleeding disorders community.